In the last video, I introduced Fatimid Imam Khalif al-Hakim, and what I'd like to do in this video is talk some more about al-Hakim's reign and what happened during the course of that reign. Uh, so for starters, al-Hakim really worked extensively towards uh, extending Fatimid rule into uh, other dominions, and those dominions included places like, uh, uh, like Iran and Persia as well. And he basically extended the rule, the suzerainty, of uh, the Fatimid Empire into Iraq uh, and Persia, okay, among other places. And in that regard, actually, what Al-Hakim relied upon was a network of what are known as, of, as dais. And dais are basically Ismaili uh, missionaries. They basically go out and they, they proselytize the faith uh, to others, and they help establish local bases in particular regions and areas. And actually, one of the most well-known and prominent dais among the Fatimids uh, was a dai by the name of Hamid al-Din Kermani. Hamid al-Din Kermani. Actually, um, what Hamid al-Din Kermani uh, really did is he he really established uh, a number of local bases for the Fatimids. He was an accomplished uh, theologian and philosopher and um, made a number of contributions. Let me actually try to spell it a bit more clearly so you can see. Um, Kirmani, K-I-R-M-A-N-I, -I. it was the transliteration of Kirmani. Now through the efforts of people like Hamid, Al Hamid al-Din Kirmani and other dais, a number of dominions outside of Cairo began to acknowledge the authority, the, the, the suzerainty of al-Hakim, and in particular uh, that included people like Kirwas bin al-Muqalla, who was the Shiite uh, Ukhid ruler of Mosul, Kufa, um, and other regions also began to accept Imam al-Hakim's authority. Uh, and also, uh, Ali bin al-Asadi, who at that time was the chief of the Banu Asad, followed suit in Hilla and other areas that were under his dominion. Now, as more rulers began to accept al-Hakim's authority, uh, he began to attract some enemies and, and people who were concerned and, and maybe perhaps a bit jealous at, at his success. And one of those enemies was an Abbasid caliph. An Abbasid caliph... Uh, by the name of uh, Qadir. Okay, and this Abbasid Caliph Qadir basically tried to stem the tide of Al-Hakim's growing power. He really um, was not happy about what was happening with Al-Hakim, and he basically tried um, to limit Al-Hakim's growing power through what became known as the the Baghdad or the Baghdad Manifesto. The Baghdad Manifesto, and basically the the Baghdad Manifesto was a document, it was a written document that was prepared by a number of Sunni and Twelver scholars, uh, but these scholars actually were under the command of Qadir. Okay? Now Sunnis and Twelvers, as you may already know, represent different sects of Islam, and these two sects actually differ between each other with regard to how spiritual successorship after the Prophet's death took place. But perhaps what's more maybe a bit more relevant in this context, is that both of these sects actually differ with the Ismaili interpretation as well. Okay? And the Baghdad Manifesto, basically, the document itself implied that Imam al-Hakim and his direct ancestors were actually not descendants of the Prophet through his cousin and son-in-law, Hazrat Ali, and his daughter, Fatima. And as a result, this document, this Baghdad Manifesto, tried to raise doubts about al-Hakim's right to the Fatimid Caliph. Because at that time, the, the feeling was that uh, the Imam Caliphs had to come directly from the Prophet's line of successors um, via the Prophet's son-in-law, Hazrat Ali, and his daughter, Hazrat Bibi Fatima. And only their progeny was going to be allowed to take on uh, such an important and prominent role. Okay? Now, what the... Uh, what the document, uh, what happened with the document in particular is it was actually it was read out during Friday prayers throughout a number of Abbasid dominions. And, you know, in addition to actually that document itself, the Abbasid Caliph Qadir also commissioned documents that tried to cast aspersions on the underlying Ismaili doctrine as well. Okay? So moving on, one important, uh, one monumental contribution, I mean, important is, is even understanding the monumental contribution of al-Hakim was in establishing what became known, what was known as the Dar al-Ilm. The Dar al-Ilm, uh, which basically means the house, the house
house of knowledge. Okay? And according to the Institute of Ismaili Studies, Dar al Ulum was, quote, a scholarly institution founded in Cairo by the Fatimid Caliph Imam al Hakim in 1005 CE. Its building housed a large library containing thousands of volumes and a public meeting room. It was the meeting place for traditionists, grammarians, jurists, astronomers, logicians, and mathematicians. It was there that Al Khali al Numan, who died in 974, gave lectures on the Ismaili Dawah, and these lectures actually were called the Majalis al Hikmah. The Majalis al Hikmah, and that actually stands for the, the Sessions of Knowledge. The Sessions, or actually the Sessions of Wisdom, rather. The Sessions of Wisdom. Okay? And these Majalis al Hikmah, or Sessions of Wisdom, were really just. Uh, private, and they involve discussing various esoteric or uh, what's known as botany. And botany is a term that means esoteric uh, botany doctrines of the Ismailis. And actually, the Imam al Hakim even attended some of these sessions himself. So the Dar al Ulum itself proved to be a very effective training ground for many Fatimid dais. But in, in a broader sense, Dar al Ulum really made education more publicly accessible. Now, the Dar al-Ulm was also referred to sometimes as the Dar al-Hikmah, or the, uh, the House of Knowledge. The Dar al-Hikmah, the House of Knowledge. And um, I want to point out and really emphasize that establishing the Dar al-Ulm is considered one of Imam al-Hakim's most important contributions. It really was his legacy for quite some time. Now, I did a separate series of videos on the Dar al-Ulm, and I would encourage you to watch those videos if you are interested in getting some additional details on it. Okay, so another fascinating aspect of Imam al Hakim's uh, reign was his association with what became called the Druze movement. The Druze movement, and the Druze movement, um, the followers rather of the Druze movement, really accorded a level of uh, divinity to Imam al Hakim. They really accorded him with a divine status, effectively. And that status actually was an outcrop of, of doctrines that were propagated by Ismaili dais, and, and the Ismaili dais included uh, people like uh, Hassan Akram, Hassan Akram, and uh, Hamza bin Ali, Hamza bin Ali, and finally um, also Muhammad. Darzi, and, and actually Muhammad Darzi, it's worth pointing out that it was his name, kind of the eponym, uh, for the Druze movement. And the Druze movement actually takes its name from Darzi. So you see Darzi and Druze are similar sounding to each other. Now the result of these doctrines was a distinct religious movement that really, in many ways, effectively tried to end or put the kibosh on Islam as, as they knew it then. And actually, the fact that this movement even existed caused a lot of upheaval, especially during the later part of al Hakim's time as a caliph. Now, aside from claims that were made by certain Sunni authors who were naturally biased, there actually is no historical evidence to suggest that al Hakim even supported the Druze movement. Okay. In fact, moreover, the Dai um, Hamid al-Din Kermani actually, having been invited by the chief Dai, Khatkin al Dai prepared works to refute and inhibit the spread of these Druze doctrines. So, even though there are some people out there who thought that al Hakim was you know, behind the Druze movement, uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest the contrary. There is actually, in fact, no historical evidence to suggest that he really supported the Druze movement, and all the people who said he did uh, were, were actually people who were uh, inherently biased against al Hakim. So, that's really all I wanted to say about. Imam al-Hakim. Hopefully you found this video and the previous one useful.